Engineers of Reddit, what's the most ridiculous idiot proofing you've had to add in your never ending quest to combat stupid people? I work on cars, so almost everything is designed around protecting people. My favorite is that we have to make the HVAC system louder and engine noise insulation worse because people will complain if they can't hear the systems running. We could make almost silent air ducts, but our warranty spend would go up. We could make almost silent air ducts, but our warranty spend would go up. Not only that, but the quieter you make one thing, the more noticeable and annoying are the far more difficult to suppress squeaks and rattles become. There's amazing amounts of soundproofing and rattle prevention built into modern cars. We had a pedestrian bridge next to a bridge for vehicles, separated by about a 3 foot gap. The bridges were about 20 feet high over the water, so many drunk pedestrians climbed over the rails and tried to jump between bridges and didn't make it that I was directed to design a safety net to hang between the two bridges. There's a bridge in North Vancouver gap between west eastbound lanes. Maybe 15 years ago a police chase happens and the perp tries to jump to the other side, falls 200 featuring into the river below, they've since put bars across it. Wife is a civil engineer, the one that came to mind for her was that she had to add to the specification of a construction contract that stated that workers would not drink the water that accumulated at the bottom of an excavation. Everyone knows that water is for Darsani, can't have the workers dipping into their profit. I work remodeling small businesses, our niche is we keep the business running while doing the remodel. I've caught people climbing over fences, ducking under moving heavy machinery, broke into locked doors all to act surprised when we tell them this area is off limits and point to one of the 10 signs we posted. I clean up crime scenes, I've had people duck under police tape lines, open the zipper on poly sheet in containment, walk through blood and brain spatter and walk up to a tech wearing a Tyvek suit, gloves, rubber boots, and a full face cartridge respirator to see what's going on. I'm a mechie intern. I walked in on my manager discussing a design with another engineer. All I heard was so the guys will probably use that as a hammer so I made it out of this stronger material when they're working they will probably be throwing this small door open so I used stronger hinges and added a stop. It's things like this that I really appreciate about my internship. I likely wouldn't have thought about that myself. One of my professors worked for years designing mining equipment and has on several occasions told us that every single design should be strong enough that the finished product can be used as a hammer without breaking because it will always be used as a hammer. Not my site, but a co-workers who gave us updates at our weekly oversight coordination meeting. Back in the summer of 2016. His construction site had a 60 foot pit on site which was being excavated safely per all industry regs. However it did not have 24H lighting and there was minimal fencing around the edge. This was fine because they were only excavating during the day, and access to upper edge was blocked off and controlled, and the whole site was properly controlled and fenced off. All obligatory safety measures necessary were in play and the laydown area was controlled. You know what else happened in the summer of 2016? Pokemon Go came out. There were three Poké stops on the site. He had to hire round the clock security so people wouldn't sneak onto the site in the middle of the night and die. Then it turns out people got clever, and you had groups where like 4 people would run diversion for security while they gave all their phones to another person, who would sneak onto the site in the middle of the night and run everyone's phone. So they had to hire more security to prevent this diversion tactic from working. Luckily, as everyone remembers, most people lost interest after a month and they stopped coming. When you're doing a risk plan, you think about schedule and budget. You don't think what's my risk mitigation strategy for a breakout mobile game enticing idiots to accidentally dump their corpse on my worksite, and how much money should I set aside to manage it? There were stories of churches, hospitals, and cemeteries petitioning the game company to remove their locations to keep people from vandalizing stuff while they played. Application engineer here. When handling a 3D lasso scanner, it has to be placed and fixed on a stable tripod. A flat rail of a balcony is not a suitable substitute for it. And no, the insurance has not covered the total loss of the device after it fell from the fifth floor to the concrete pavement. Took the physical disable Wi-Fi button off laptops. Clearly marked, but people would still flip it and wonder why their Wi-Fi went off. 
I worked in a call center and all of the PCS were slung on straps under the desks. I'd love to know which genius came up with that idea. So, people would be on the phone swinging back and forth in their chair and hit the power button. Then I'd get a ticket saying my modem keeps turning off. I disabled the power button from immediately shutting down the PC if you pressed it but of course they'd get into a position sometimes where it'd be held down long enough to override it. Solution? Duct tape and a bottle cap. Once we upgraded all the PCS to new ones I took the time to remove those stupid straps and put the PCS behind the monitor out of reach instead. Your solution was to stop people from touching the computer. It worked. Civil engineer here. While laying asphalt usually we close the road and cover using barricade tapes. But no matter his hard we try people always find ways to go through and ruin the whole process. Ultimately we had to use security to block the roads. A couple of years ago the closest supermarket had an internal power issue. The store was mostly fine but the power to the refrigerated cases was out. While it was being serviced they chained the doors shut and then blocked access to them with a row of nested shopping carts. There were still people doing their damnedest to get in there. Engineering co-worker always told the story of when he used to work support at one of the leading electronic lab equipment. For example, oscilloscopes, companies, engineers would call or email when a piece of hardware stopped working. And the initial support advice was to ask the engineer to check the polarity on the power cable, just in case it was, ahem, plugged in incorrectly. For network cables, if we suspect the user doesn't have it plugged in properly we ask them to switch it around so they're forced to reseat both ends. Years ago I worked as a building engineer, glorified maintenance man, for an office building that had endless complaints about the AC heater not working. The staff in the office would adjust the thermostat up and down all day, and then everyone else would complain it was too hot or too cold. It did not matter what kind of lock or cage I put on it, they would break and remove within a day or two of a new one being installed. So I got a new thermostat with a remote sensor and installed it in my office with the remote sensor near where the old T-stat was, and I left the old T-stat in place with low voltage power so that it would appear to function. Then I let them change the temp on the old T-stat all they wanted while I programmed the real one in my office to our building standards. Poof. Just like that the complaints were reduced by 90%. I was always pretty sure most office thermostats were placebo thermostats that didn't do anything. Former combat engineer here. We built a 3 foot high fence across a minefield including huge red warning triangles every 4 feet. Someone still stepped over it to go take a crap in the woods. They were carried out on a stretcher. Nothing is idiot proof. The guys carrying the stretcher were probably crapping themselves too. Reminds me of one of my first design jobs. Okay boss, I've got the design. The front footing needs to be 20 inches wide, the rear footing is 17 inches wide. So both of them are 20 inches. Why do we need a 20 inch if a 17 inch will work? Because that way we don't have to worry about the construction guys building a 17 inch front footing and a 20 inch rear footing. I work for the utility company, mainly in the distribution of natural gas. All of the pipelines we put into the ground are either yellow, or black and yellow, and only gas is allowed to use yellow for their pipes. Some of them have natural gas printed on them in big bold letters. We put special tape about 20 centimeters above the pipeline to indicate that there is a gas pipeline below and whomever is digging there should be careful. All these precautions and warnings, and we still get daily incidents from idiots who were digging somewhere, and hit a gas pipeline. The worst part is you can call someone to come out and tell you where the line's buried before you even start to dig. Structural engineering at an industrial facility. Switched to pipe or HSS for bracing because anything made out of angle would be immediately torched out of the way if it ever got remotely close to anything maintenance wanted to work on since it was just an angle iron. That logic is so backwards. It's not like it's what's holding up the thing above your head. I worked at a massive Silicon Valley tech firm whom you may have purchased printers, PCS, test equipment and servers from. We designed a storage system in the early 90s that had an LED that blinked when the system was on. Customers thought the storage system was slow based on the rate of the blinking. We quadrupled the blink rate and never had a customer complaint again. An app which scans barcodes to recognize items. 
It runs on Android and uses the device's camera to handle the scanning bit. The number of times the question is asked, is this supported on secure cameraless devices? Or, our devices don't have cameras and they don't have a barcode scanner. Can the app still work? I split my head open on a fuse box at work and had to get my head stapled shut. The next day the maintenance guy tied a pool noodle to the bottom of the box. I felt like a moron because I had to sit right next to it every day. As someone with sensory issues that make it hard to tell how far away parts of my body are from things, I put the pool noodles up myself, to protect me from me. Boss shared a story about how they had to make their no-step stickers on agriculture equipment. Places you should not step, texture and more grippy because people sued after slipping on them. I'm late the party but, I design highway signs. People think signs are just placed willy-nilly and are spray painted on plywood. Nope. What they say, where they're placed, the material they're made from are all carefully engineered and based on mathematical equations for how well an average someone is able to 1. Read the text pictograph. 2. React to what the sign depicts, whether it's directions, stop signs, or warning you there's falling rocks. Placing too many signs overstimulates drivers and causes informational overload. Tons of roadside objects also actually create a roadside hazard. Not every stupid thing drivers do can be solved with signs. My job pretty much revolves around trying to idiot proof roads to the point where no reasonable person acting within a reasonable way should get in an accident by following the road speed limit and warning signs. Also, please never steal a sign. Mechanical engineer. I work on systems that need to be light and durable, but the business guys want it cheap. This is a choose to sort of situation so you can probably guess what got dropped. I can't tell you how many times I've told the operators to not intentionally drop the product from 6 plus featuring onto concrete. Can't get specific, since it's a very niche classified market. Knew an engineer once who, when being obviously lied to by a salesperson, asked if the part in question had passed the balconies test. Yes, the salesperson responded, so the engineer picked up the part in question, turned around and threw it off the balcony, didn't pass. Not me personally, but in a different module in a factory I used to work in, a guy stuck his hands into a heated acid vat to grab material he had dropped. His PPE saved him from chemical burns, but he did end up with second degree burns. I saw their modules process engineer walking around our area and looking at the acid vats. He said he was considering putting up don't stick your hands in the acid signs up, and we joked about no swimming signs instead. Industrial designer here, you have no idea how many pointers I have to add to the products I make. X, I had to add arrows to a product that had 2 piece THT the client could put together and remove for cleanup. It was designed to that it could only fit into one position and it was made very obvious which position that was. Think a larger shape in hole. No, I still had to put two arrows in case people couldn't tell the bigger bump could only fit in the bigger gap. Ever write any software? The amount of error checking you have to do on any user input is phenomenal. No matter how much explanation you provide, users seem to be chimpanzees entering stuff seemingly at random. Software engineer who's training me right now. I can make an application that does exactly it needs to in about a month. The hard part is making it not do what you don't want it to do. That takes 6 months. Not too exciting, but most of the real stupid stupid proofing ends up in labeling. Namely the IFU DFU, user manual. The real ridiculousness happens in the failure mode effect analysis. FMEA, meetings. This is where you have to imagine every thinkable possible misuse, no matter how outlandish, and assign an occurrence score and severity score, then mitigate. Often in the IFU, these meetings bring out an infuriatingly creative side from your QA people, who are otherwise the most uncreative people in the office. I worked on an old mainframe system that we'd so sufficiently idiot proofed that the workers started just saying if it'll let you do it, it must be okay, instead of understanding their processes. When we replaced that system, we found all sorts of things they'd been doing against policy, because no one knew it was against policy, and so no one told us to write a new catch to stop them from doing it. Then after we replaced the system, we basically had to replace everyone, because they kept just doing whatever the new system would allow, except the new system had none of those checks, 
so we had a few months where literally nothing was in line with policy. We had to try to explain to them that it was literally their jobs to know what the policy was, and enforce it. Outside plant engineer here. In 1996 we were put on an all hands fix Utah project. The Olympics were coming, and all of Utah's planners and engineers were working on that, and we were to pick up the slack on the day to day jobs that needed to be worked. I had finished one job, a simple buried straight line copper distribution, no big deal, I finished it up, and they told me to run it by Randy, the senior OSP engineer from Utah, I got the job back, with a note to allocate money for custom armored plating for the pedestals, the green ugly things in your front or backyards, why, because apparently the locals use them for target practice, and the arm I had to withstand a direct hit from a 3006. I never had to do that anywhere else I worked, but I haven't worked everywhere, yet. Way back when, I designed a product that had an optional battery module that was meant to connect to a main module. To assemble the battery module to the main module, you had to put the round peg in the round hole and the square peg in the square hole. That's it. I even put a freaking sticker with instructions on the back on the battery module. Even so, we still had around 1% of clients that couldn't figure it out this puzzle. One particular client had used a hammer to force the module together the wrong way. Another had tried to solder wires through the holes and pegs. Another didn't understand that he had to connect the battery module to the main module for the former to power the latter. You can't engineer around stupid. There's no worst case. It goes all the way down past zero to minus infinity. Our head engineer would be sent off to other companies in the group to troubleshoot problems for them that they couldn't solve. One of his sites had a problem of red plastic pieces in the finished product, like plastic bag material. He's flown from Europe to Asia to investigate. It was a powder mix that was being created by blending other powders together. He gets to site. They show him the end of the line where this red stuff is coming out in the product. Naturally he goes to the start of the process to work his way through eliminating causes. First thing he sees at the start of the line is a worker chucking bags of ingredient into one of the hoppers. The bags were red, and plastic. He takes a closer look. They've built a shredding mechanism on top of the hopper. So that the worker just has to chuck the bag in the hopper and the shredder will rip it open. This logic here was to save time not having to open the bags. He asked the site manager if they were having him on. That is, taking the pee. They weren't. They literally couldn't connect the dots that this was the source of the red plastic pieces. The solution was to stop doing that haha. Aero Eng here. Someone on our team everyone hyped up was the most unqualified person I've ever met. 8 years experience and they openly admitted they cheated not just on their exams, but also their mask thesis. Anyways, this person didn't even know the basic equations for aerodynamics and aircraft performance, couldn't code despite seeing the same code for years, and still couldn't use in-house tools that myself and two other new people learned in about 3 months on the job. This person also openly stole my presentations and worked a show in group meetings, even forgot to swap my name at the end slide once. We got so tired of doing their work and spoon feeding them stuff and the managers turning a blind eye to them and telling them stuff they should have known that we actually ended up coding an error message prompts to clue them in when they got to the same questions we answered millions of times. When that didn't click in, I actually coded in messages showing them which lines to go to to find common issues. Guess what 5 years of MATLAB and 14, they still couldn't use a debugger. I actually got personally so annoyed that I had certain error catches go to their printer and email to clue them in. I could go on for ages but this was hands down the worst engineer I'll probably ever meet. The only thing this person was good at was sucking up to the right people and getting away with the most blatant disqualifications I'll ever see. But they're doing their PhD now. Well thanks for making me feel good about myself. I'm an idiot but at least I I can use MATLAB. When designing hardware for the exterior of the ISS, you're prohibited from making anything with holes of a certain size, so that the astronauts don't get their fingers stuck. In uni I had to take a safety course and the professor told us, every warning is there because someone died because of it, please don't be responsible for the next one, thanks. Safety standards are written in blood. I used to work as a mechanical designer at an automation company. We built pallet dispensers for warehouses, 
They are a big metal box where a forklift will load 40 AT pallets into them as a double stack, and the machine spits them out two at a time at the bottom for all the picking trucks. The dispenser was lag bolted to the floor. Anyway we get a warranty complaint. The mounting bolts are broken and it keeps moving. Huh. Turns out the warehouse guys weren't slowing down to get pallets from the machine, but ramming it and using it as a brake. It was at the end of a corridor so they had a nice long run up. We had to turn the machine 90 degrees so they couldn't build up speed and double the number of lag bolts and up the size. I'm in the process of turning my wood crafting hobby into a career. With every project I add to my portfolio, I've seen a lot of requests for desks that are so customized, they want everything that can't happen. They want an armrest where there's also a cuff holder. They want a keyboard at this height while having the monitor at that height. All these impossible requests. I eventually sat down and thought to myself, if I was super lazy and didn't want to move from one spot, what would make for the perfect office desk? So I made one. Got $150 from it. I'm looking for a desk right now and the cheapest I can find one that isn't garbage is like $500. Not an engineer, but I've had to introduce a number of idiot proofing measures on spreadsheets I've built for businesses over the years. The one that stands out the most was when we introduced an update to an established spreadsheet that required managers to populate column B with true false for every populated row and this was frequently not done. Despite extensive training have UG been supplied, so I added a before save macro that checked the number of completed rows in columns A and B, and if not the same would display, in great detail, a very helpful pop, up stating that the file could not be savey 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 I got a call from a manager the next day complaining about this weird message that had appeared which said something about completing column B and he asked me where is column B, my reply, well manager name. Column B is traditionally located between column A and column C. Chemi. Maybe not the most ridiculous, but might be my favorite story. We used a nuclear level sensor to measure how full a hopper was in a highly flammable environment so we didn't need to cut any penetrations in the side of the system and potentially leak solvent vapor. The nuclear source in these systems is encased in a heavy duty lead box. We had to add a half inch thick stainless steel shroud around the back of the source after we walked in one morning to find hammer marks all along the outside of the box. The hopper had accumulated some buildup during the night and the operator couldn't think of a better place to pound on to break it up than the nuclear source. <laughs> IT we replaced CRTs with flat screen LDCs in the HR department and head of HR had a sign that we won't steal nor sell the data stored in the monitors. I don't trust HR to know which devices contain data, they call everything except the mouse the modem. <laughs> Software engineer. Sort of made parts of a website to let the customer decide where they would like holes in our product. Did not realize customers would fill in a hole with a diameter of 0 every 0 millimeters. So no hole was made, and the air supply it was supposed to give did not work very well. Now they can no longer pick 0, it has to be more, and added an extra button in case someone actually did not need holes. Any developer had better check sanitize form inputs to make sure they are within parameters. The people are going to plug in letters, fractions, negative numbers, etc. Either accidentally or on purpose. One of our manufacturing engineers was tired of production workers using expensive air tools as hammers. So he drilled a hole in the base of a wood handled hammer and glued in an air connector. Having them hook it up to air and be amazed at how good it performed was amazing. Structural engineer. When designing a handwheel for a door on a ship, we had to intentionally design the handwheel to break before the shaft, because we can't trust idiots to not spin it as hard as they possibly can, destroying the entire door in the process. I told the plant manager to stop trying to foolproof everything. I explained we had some very talented fools. He agreed. Not an engineer but worked for a fireplace company when they had to start adding big stickers on our gas and wood fireplaces that say, paraphrased, but not far off, caution, fireplace extremely hot when in use. They were sued all the time for people getting burned, for things such as, but not limited to, a touching burning logs, fireplace tools sold, separately, allowing children to place hand on fireplace glass, gas. Melting breaking TVs that were mounted on top without proper clearances hardware. Burning house down or other damage from admitted misuse. 
to give some context to the last one. Storing dry wood in front of the fireplace. Storing camp fuel in plastic containers in front of fireplace. Change log placement. Gas, then discovered soot all over their room. You must do it the way they say, period. Tried to use the wrong gas type, LPNG. There are many more, but it got me the most there are folks out there who don't realize that fire is hot. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.